Section five of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section five. Number two. The Pines. Nineteen fourteen. Author's note. Early in the year 1914, Mr. Edmund Goss told me he was asking certain of his friends to write for him a few words apiece in description of Swinburne as they had known or seen him at one time or another, and he was so good as to wish to include in this gathering a few words by myself. I found it hard to be brief without seeming irreverent. I failed in the attempt to make of my subject a snapshot that was not a grotesque. So I took refuge in an ampler scope. I wrote a reminiscential essay. From that essay I made an extract, which I gave to Mr. Goss. From that extract he made a quotation in his enchanting biography. The words quoted by him reappear here in the midst of the whole essay as I wrote it. I dare not hope they are unashamed of their humble surroundings. M. B. End of Author's Note In my youth the suburbs were rather looked down on. I never quite knew why. It was held anomalous, and a matter for merriment, that Swinburne lived in one of them. For my part, had I known as a fact that Catullus was still alive, I should have been as ready to imagine him living in Putney as elsewhere. The marvel would have been merely that he lived. And Swinburne's survival struck as surely as could his have struck in me the chord of wonder. Not, of course, that he had achieved a feat of longevity, he was far from the psalmist's limit, nor was he one of those men whom one associates with the era in which they happened to be young. Indeed, if there was one man belonging less than any other to mid-Victorian days, Swinburne was that man. But by the calendar it was in those days that he had blazed, blazed forth with so unexampled a suddenness of splendour and in the light of that conflagration all that he had since done much and magnificent though this was paled the essential swinburne was still the earliest he was and would always be the flammiferous boy of the dim past a legendary creature soul kin to the phoenix it had been impossible that he should ever surpass himself in the artistry that was, from the outset, his, impossible that he should bring forth rhythms lovelier and greater than those early rhythms, or exercise over them a mastery more than absolute. Also it had been impossible that the first wild ardour of spirit should abide unsinkingly in him, youth goes and there was not in swinburne that basis on which a man may in his maturity so build as to make good in some degree the loss of what is gone he was not a thinker his mind rose ever away from reason to rhapsody neither was he human he was a king crowned but not throned he was a singing bird that could build no nest he was a youth who could not afford to age had he died young literature would have lost many glories but none so great as the glories he had already given nor any such as we should fondly imagine ourselves bereft of by his early death a great part of keats's fame rested on our assumption of what he would have done but even granting that keats may have had in him more than had swinburne of stuff for development i believe that had he lived on we should think of him as author of the poems that in fact we know not philosophy after all not humanity just sheer joyous power of song is the primal thing in poetry 
ideas and flesh and blood are but reserves to be brought up when the poet's youth is going when the bird can no longer sing in flight let the nest be ready after the king has dazzled us with his crown let him have something to sit down on but the session on throne or in nest is not the divine period had swinburne's genius been of the kind that solidifies he would yet at the close of the nineteenth century have been for us young men virtually though not so definitely as in fact he was the writer of atalanta in caledon and of poems and ballads tennyson's death in ninety eight had not taken us at all by surprise we had been fully aware that he was alive he had always been careful to keep himself abreast of the times anything that came along the nebular hypothesis at one moment the imperial institute at another one mention from his muse he had husbanded for his old age that which he had long ago inherited middle age if in our mourning for him there really was any tincture of surprise this was due to merely the vague sense that he had in the fullness of time died rather prematurely his middle age might have been expected to go on flourishing for ever but assuredly tennyson dead laid no such strain on our fancy as swinburne living it is true that swinburne did from time to time take public notice of current affairs but what notice he took did but seem to mark his remoteness from them from us the boars i remember were the theme of a sonnet which embarrassed even their angriest enemies in our midst he likened them if i remember rightly to hell-hounds foaming at the jaws this was by some people taken as a sign that he had fallen away from that high generosity of spirit which had once been his to me it meant merely that he thought of poor little england writhing under the heel of an alien despotism just as in the days when he really was interested in such matters poor little italy had risen i suspect too that the first impulse to write about the boers came not from the muse within but from theodore watts dunton without now algernon we're at war you know at war with the boers i don't want to bother you at all but i do think my dear old friend you oughtn't to let slip this opportunity of etc etc some such hortation is easily imaginable by any one who saw the two old friends together the first time i had this honour this sight for lasting and affectionate memory must have been in the spring of ninety nine in those days theodore watts he had but recently taken on the dunton was still something of a gadabout i had met him here and there he had said in his stentorian tones pleasant things to me about my writing i sent him a new little book of mine and in acknowledging this he asked me to come down to putney and have luncheon and meet swinburne meet catullus on the day appointed i came as one whose feet half linger it is but a few steps from the railway station in putney high street to number two the pines i had expected a greater distance to the sanctuary a walk in which to compose my mind and prepare myself for initiation i laid my hand irresolutely against the gate of the bleak trim front garden i withdrew my hand i went away out here were all the aspects of common modern life in there was swinburne a butcher boy went by whistling he was not going to see swinburne he could afford to whistle i pursued my dilatory course up the slope of putney but at length it occurred to me that unpunctuality would after all be an imperfect expression of reverence and i retraced my footsteps number two prosaic inscription 
but as that front door closed behind me i had the instant sense of having slipped away from the harsh light of the ordinary and contemporary into the dimness of an odd august past here in this dark hall the past was present here loomed vivid and vital on the walls those women of rossetti whom i had known but as shades familiar to me in small reproductions by photogravure here they themselves were life-sized with curled-up lips and amorous hair done in the original warm crayon all of them intently looking down on me while i took off my overcoat all wondering who was this intruder from posterity that they hung in the hall evidently no more than an overflow was an earnest of packed plenitude within the room i was ushered into was a back room a dining room looking on to a good garden it was in form and fixtures an inalienably mid-victorian room and held its stolid own in the riot of rossetti's its proportions its window-sash bisecting the view of garden its folding doors through which i heard the voice of watts dunton booming mysteriously in the front room its mantelpiece its gas brackets all proclaimed that nothing ever would seduce them from their allegiance to martin tupper nor me from mine said the sturdy cruet stand on the long expanse of tablecloth the voice of watts dunton ceased suddenly and a few moments later its owner appeared he had been dictating he explained a great deal of work on hand just now a great deal of work i remember that on my subsequent visits he was always at the moment of my arrival dictating and always greeted me with that phrase a great deal of work on hand just now i used to wonder what work it was for he published little enough but i never ventured to inquire and indeed rather cherished the mystery it was a part of the dear little old man it went with the something gnome-like about his swarthiness and chubbiness went with the shaggy hair that fell over the collar of his eternally crumpled frock-coat the shaggy eyebrows that hung over his bright little brown eyes the shaggy moustache that hid his small round chin it was a mystery inherent in the richly laden atmosphere of the pines while i stood talking to watts dunton talking as loudly as he for he was very deaf i enjoyed the thrill of suspense in watching the door through which would appear swinburne i asked after mr swinburne's health watts dunton said it was very good he always goes out for his long walk in the morning wonderfully active active in mind too but i'm afraid you won't be able to get into touch with him he's almost stone deaf poor fellow almost stone deaf now he changed the subject and i felt i must be careful not to seem interested in swinburne exclusively i spoke of aylwin the parlour-maid brought in the hot dishes the great moment was at hand nor was i disappointed swinburne's entry was for me a great moment here suddenly visible in the flesh was the legendary being and divine singer here he was shutting the door behind him as might anybody else and advancing a strange small figure in grey having an air at once noble and roguish proud and skittish my name was roared to him in shaking his hand i bowed low of course a bow de coeur and he in the old aristocratic manner bowed equally low but with such swiftness that we narrowly escaped concussion you do not usually associate a man of genius when you see one with any social class and swinburne being of an aspect so unrelated as it was to any species of human kind 
I wondered the more that almost the first impression he made on me, or would make on any one, was that of a very great gentleman indeed. Not of an old gentleman either. Sparse and straggling though the grey hair was that fringed the immense pale dome of his head, and venerably haloed though he was for me by his greatness, there was yet about him something boyish girlish childish rather something of a beautifully well-bred child but he had the eyes of a god and the smile of an elf in figure at first glance he seemed almost fat but this was merely because of the way he carried himself with his long neck strained so tightly back that he all receded from the waist upwards i noticed afterwards that this deportment made the back of his jacket hang quite far away from his legs and so small and sloping were his shoulders that the jacket seemed ever so likely to slip right off i became aware too that when he bowed he did not unbend his back but only his neck the length of the neck accounting for the depth of the bow his hands were tiny even for his size and they fluttered helplessly touchingly unceasingly directly after my introduction we sat down to the meal of course i had never hoped to get into touch with him reciprocally quite apart from his deafness i was too modest to suppose he could be interested in anything i might say but for i knew he had once been as high and copious a singer in talk as in verse i had hoped to hear utterances from him and it did not seem that my hope was to be fulfilled watts dunton sat at the head of the table with a huge and very tupperesque joint of roast mutton in front of him swinburne and myself close up to him on either side he talked only to me this was the more tantalizing because swinburne seemed as though he were bubbling over with all sorts of notions not that he looked at either of us he smiled only to himself and to his plateful of meat and to the small bottle of bass's pale ale that stood before him ultimate allowance of one who had erst clashed cymbals in noxus this small bottle he eyed often and with enthusiasm seeming to waver between the rapture of broaching it now and the grandeur of having it to look forward to it made me unhappy to see what trouble he had in managing his knife and fork watts dunton told me on another occasion that this infirmity of the hands had been lifelong had begun before eton days the swinburne family had been alarmed by it and had consulted a specialist who said that it resulted from an excess of electric vitality and that any attempt to stop it would be harmful so they had let it be i have known no man of genius who had not to pay in some affliction or defect either physical or spiritual for what the gods had given him here in this fluttering of his tiny hands was a part of the price that swinburne had to pay no doubt he had grown accustomed to it many lustres before i met him and i need not have felt at all unhappy at what i tried not to see he evidently was quite gay in his silence and in the world that was for him silent i had however the maddening suspicion that he would have liked to talk why wouldn't watts dunton roar him an opportunity i felt i had been right perhaps in feeling that the lesser man was no not jealous of the greater whom he had guarded so long and with such love but anxious that he himself should be as fully impressive to visitors as his fine gifts warranted not indeed that he monopolized the talk he seemed to regard me as a source of information about all the latest movements, and I had to shout banalities while he munched his mutton, banalities whose one saving grace for me was that they were inaudible to Swinburne. Had I met Swinburne's gaze, I should have faltered. 
now and again his shining light grey eyes roved from the table darting this way and that across the room up at the ceiling out of the window only never at us somehow this aloofness gave no hint of indifference it seemed to be rather a point in good manners the good manners of a child sitting up to table not staring not asking questions and reflecting great credit on its invaluable old nurse the child sat happy in the wealth of its inner life the child was content not to speak until it were spoken to but but i felt it did want to be spoken to and at length it was so soon as the mutton had been replaced by the apple pie watts dunton leaned forward and well algernon he roared how was it on the heath to-day swinburne who had meekly inclined his ear to the question now threw back his head uttering a sound that was like the cooing of a dove and forthwith rapidly ever so musically he spoke to us of his walk spoke not in the strain of a man who had been taking his daily exercise on putney heath but rather in that of a peri who had at long last been suffered to pass through paradise and rather than that he spoke would i say that he cooingly and flutingly sang of his experience the wonders of this morning's wind and sun and clouds were expressed in a flow of words so right and sentences so perfectly balanced that they would have seemed pedantic had they not been clearly as spontaneous as the wordless notes of a bird in song the frail sweet voice rose and fell lingered quickened in all manner of trills and roulades that he himself could not hear it seemed to me the greatest loss his deafness inflicted on him one would have expected this disability to mar the music but it didn't save that now and again a note would come out metallic and over shrill the tones were under good control the whole manner and method had certainly a strong element of oddness but no one incapable of condemning as unmanly the song of a lark would have called it affected i had met young men of whose enunciation swinburne's now reminded me in them the thing had always irritated me very much and i now became sure that it had been derived from people who had derived it in old balliol days from swinburne himself one of the points familiar to me in such enunciation was the habit of stressing extremely and lackadaisically dwelling on some particular syllable in swinburne this trick was delightful because it wasn't a trick but a need of his heart well do i remember his ecstasy of emphasis and immensity of pause when he described how he had seen in a perambulator on the heath to-day the most beautiful babby ever beheld by mortal eyes for babies as some of his later volumes testify he had a sort of idolatry after mazzini had followed landor to elysium and victor hugo had followed mazzini babies were what among live creatures most evoked swinburne's genius for self-abasement his rapture about this especial babby was such as to shake within me my hitherto firm conviction that whereas the young of the brute creation are already beautiful at the age of five minutes the human young never begin to be so before the age of three years i suspect watts dunton of having shared my lack of innate enthusiasm but it was one of swinburne's charms as i was to find that he took for granted every one's delight in what he himself so fervidly delighted in he could as soon have imagined a man not loving the very sea as not doting on the aspect of babies and not reading at least one play by an elizabethan or jacobian dramatist every day i forget whether it was at this my first meal or at another that he described a storm in which one night years ago with watts dunton he had crossed the channel 
the rhythm of his great phrases was as the rhythm of those waves and his head swayed in accordance to it like the wave-rocked boat itself he hymned in memory the surge and darkness the thunder and foam and phosphorescence you remember theodore you remember the phosphorescence all so beautifully and vividly that i almost felt storm-bound and in peril of my life to disentangle one from another of the several occasions on which i heard him talk is difficult because the procedure was so invariable watts dunton always dictating when i arrived swinburne always appearing at the moment of the meal always the same simple and substantial fare swinburne never allowed to talk before the meal was half over as to this last point i soon realized that i had been quite unjust in suspecting watts dunton of selfishness it was simply a sign of the care with which he watched over his friend's welfare had swinburne been admitted earlier to the talk he would not have taken his proper quantity of roast mutton so soon always as he had taken that the embargo was removed the chance was given him and swiftly though he embraced the chance and much though he made of it in the course of apple pie and of cheese he seemed touchingly ashamed of holding forth often before he had said his really full say on the theme suggested by watts dunton's loud interrogation he would curb his speech and try to eliminate himself bowing his head over his plate and then when he had promptly been brought in again he would always try to atone for his inhibiting deafness by much reference and deference to all that we might otherwise have to say i hope he would coo to me my friend watts dunton who and here he would turn and make a little bow to watts dunton is himself a scholar will bear me out when i say or i hardly know he would flute to his old friend whether mr beerbohm here a bow to me will agree with me in my opinion of some delicate point in greek prosody or some incident in an old french romance i had never heard of on one occasion just before the removal of the mutton watts dunton had been asking me about an english translation that had been made of m rostand's cyrano de bergerac he then took my information as the match to ignite the swinburnian tinder well algernon it seems that cyrano de bergerac but this first spark was enough instantly swinburne was praising the works of cyrano de bergerac of m rostand he may have heard but him he forgot indeed i never heard swinburne mention a single contemporary writer his mind ranged and revelled always in the illustrious or obscure past to him the writings of cyrano de bergerac were as fresh as paint as fresh as to me alas was the news of their survival of course of course you have read l'histoire comique des états et des empires de la lune i admitted by gesture and facial expression that i had not whereupon he reeled out curious extracts from that allegory almost as good as gulliver with a memorable instance of the way in which that traveller to the moon was shocked by the conversation of the natives and the native sense of propriety was outraged by the conversation of the traveller in life as in that for him more truly actual thing literature it was always the preterite that enthralled him of any passing events of anything the newspapers were full of never a word from him and i should have been sorry if there had been but i did through the medium of watts dunton sometimes start him on topics that might have led him to talk of rossetti and other old comrades for me the names of those men breathed the magic of the past just as it was breathed for me by swinburne's presence for him i suppose they were but a bit of the present 
and the mere fact that they had dropped out of it was not enough to hallow them. He never mentioned them, but I was glad to see that he reveled as wistfully in the days just before his own as I in the days just before mine. He recounted to us things he had been told in his boyhood by an aged aunt, or great-aunt. One of the Ashburnhams? How, for example, she had been taken by her mother to a county ball, a distance of many miles, and on the way home through the frosty and snowy night, the family coach had suddenly stopped. There was a crowd of dark figures in the way, at which point Swinburne stopped too, before saying, with an ineffable smile, and in a voice faint with appreciation, they were burying a suicide at the crossroads. Vivid as this Hogarthian night scene was to me, I saw beside it another scene, a great panelled room, a grim old woman in a high-backed chair, and, restless on a stool at her feet, an extraordinary little nephew with masses of auburn hair and with tiny hands clasped in supplication. Tell me more, Aunt Ashburnham, tell me more. And now, clearlier still, as I write in these after years, do I see that dining room of the pines, the long white stretch of tablecloth, with Swinburne and Watts Dunton and another at the extreme end of it, Watts Dunton between us, very low down over his plate, very cosy and hirsute, and rather like the dormouse at that long tea-table which Alice found in Wonderland. I see myself sitting there, wide-eyed, as Alice sat, and had the hare been a great poet, and the hatter a great gentleman, and neither of them mad, but each only very odd and vivacious, I might see Swinburne as a glorified blend of these two. Only once was the ritual varied. Swinburne, I was told before luncheon, had expressed a wish to show me his library, so after the meal he did not bid us his usual adieu, but with much courtesy invited us and led the way. Up the staircase he then literally bounded three, literally three stairs at a time. I began to follow at the same rate, but immediately slackened speed for fear that Watts Dunton behind us might be embittered at sight of so much youth and legerity. Swinburne waited on the threshold to receive us, as it were, and pass us in. Watts Dunton went and ensconced himself snugly in a corner. The sun had appeared after a grey morning, and it pleasantly flooded this big living-room, whose walls were entirely lined with the mellow backs of books. Here, as host among his treasures, Swinburne was more than ever attractive. He was as happy as any moat in the sunshine about him, and the fluttering of his little hands, and feet too, was but as a token of so much felicity. He looked older, it is true, in the strong sunlight, but these added years made only more notable his youngness of heart. An illustrious bibliophile among his books, a birthday child, rather, among his toys. Proudly he explained to me the general system under which the volumes were ranged in this or that division of shelves. Then he conducted me to a chair near the window, left me there, flew away, flew up the rungs of a mahogany ladder, plucked a small volume, and in a twinkling was at my side. This, I think, will please you. It did. It had a beautifully engraved title page, and a pleasing scent of old, old leather. It was an editio princeps of a play by some lesser Elizabethan or Jacobian. "'Of course you know it,' my host fluted. "'How I wished I could say that I knew it, and loved it well. "'I revealed to him, for by speaking very loudly towards his inclined head "'I was able to make him hear, that I had not read it. "'He envied any one who had such pleasure in store. "'He darted to the ladder and came back, "'thrusting gently into my hands another volume of like date.' "'Of course you know this.' "'Again, I had to confess that I did not, "'and to shout my appreciation of the fount of type, "'the margins, the binding. 
he beamed agreement and fetched another volume archly he indicated the title cooing you are a lover of this i hope and again i was shamed by my inexperience i did not pretend to know this particular play but my tone implied that i had always been meaning to read it and had always by some mischance been prevented for his sake as well as my own i did want to acquit myself passably i wanted for him the pleasure of seeing his joys shared by a representative however humble of the common world i turned the leaves caressingly looking from them to him while he dilated on the beauty of this and that scene in the play anon he fetched another volume and another always with the same faith that this was a favourite of mine i quibbled i evaded i was very enthusiastic and uncomfortable it was with intense relief that i beheld the title-page of yet another volume which silently this time he laid before me the country wench this of course i have read i heartily shouted swinburne stepped back you have you have read it where he cried in evident dismay something was wrong had i not i quickly wondered read this play oh yes i shouted i have read it but when where entreated swinburne adding that he had supposed it to be the sole copy extant i floundered i wildly said i thought i must have read it years ago in the bodleian theodore do you hear this it seems that they have now a copy of the country wench in the bodleian mr beerbohm found one there oh when in what year he appealed to me i said it might have been six seven eight years ago swinburne knew for certain that no copy had been there twelve years ago and was surprised that he had not heard of the acquisition they might have told me he wailed i sacrificed myself on the altar of sympathy i admitted that i might have been mistaken must have been must have confused this play with some other i dipped into the pages and no i shouted this i have never read his equanimity was restored he was up the ladder and down again showing me further treasures with all pride and ardour at length watts dunton afraid that his old friend would tire himself arose from his corner and presently he and i went downstairs to the dining-room it was in the course of our session together there that there suddenly flashed across my mind the existence of a play called the country wife by wasn't it witcherly i had once read it or read something of it but this matter i kept to myself i thought i had appeared fool enough already i loved those sessions in that tupper settine and dining-room lair of solid old comfort and fervid old romanticism its odd duality benefited well its owner the distinguished critic and poet rossetti's closest friend and swinburne's had been for a while in the dark ages a solicitor and one felt he had been a good one his frock-coat though the muses had crumpled it inspired confidence in his judgment of other things than verses but let there be no mistake he was no mere bourgeois parnassien as his enemies insinuated no doubt he had been very useful to men of genius in virtue of qualities they lacked but the secret of his hold on them was in his own rich nature he was not only a born man of letters he was a deeply emotional human being whose appeal was as much to the heart as to the head the romantic celtic mysticism of aylwin with its lack of fashionable celtic nebulosity lends itself if you will to laughter though personally i saw nothing funny in it it seemed to me before i was in touch with the author a work of genuine expression from within and that it truly was i presently knew the mysticism of watts dunton who once comfortably settled at the fireside knew no reserve was in contrast with the frock-coat and the practical abilities but it was essential 
and they were of the surface for humorous rossetti i dare say the very contrast made theodore's company the more precious he himself had assuredly been and the memory of him still was the master fact in wat stunton's life algernon was as an adopted child gabriel as a long-lost only brother as he was to the outer world of his own day so too to posterity rossetti the man is conjectural and mysterious we know that he was in his prime the most inspiring and splendid of companions but we know this only by faith the evidence is as vague as it is emphatic of the style and substance of not a few great talkers in the past we can piece together some more or less vivid and probably erroneous notion but about rossetti nothing has been recorded in such a way as to make him even faintly emerge i suppose he had in him what reviewers seem to find so often in books a quality that defies analysis listening to watts dunton i was always in hope that when next the long lost turned up for he was continually doing so in the talk i should see him hear him and share the rapture but the revelation was not to be you might think that to hear him called gabriel would have given me a sense of propinquity but i felt no nearer to him than you feel to the archangel who bears that name and no surname it was always when watts dunton spoke carelessly casually of some to me illustrious figure in the past that i had the sense of being wafted right into that past and plumped down in the very midst of it when he spoke with reverence of this and that great man whom he had known he did not thus waft and plump me for i too revered those names but i had the magical transition whenever one of the immortals was mentioned in the tone of those who knew him before he had put on immortality browning for example was a name deeply honoured by me browning yes said watts dunton in the course of an afternoon browning and he took a sip of steaming whisky toddy that was a point in our day's ritual i was a great diner out in the old times i used to dine out every night in the week browning was a great diner out too we were always meeting what a pity he went on writing all those plays he hadn't any gift for drama none i never could understand why he took to playwriting he wagged his head gazing regretfully into the fire and added such a clever fellow too whistler though alive and about was already looked to as a hierarch by the young not so had he been looked to by rossetti the thrill of the past was always strong in me when watts dunton mentioned seldom without a guffaw did he mention jimmy whistler i think he put in the surname because that fellow had not behaved well to swinburne but he could not omit the nickname because it was impossible for him to feel the right measure of resentment against such a funny fellow as heart full of old hates as of old loves was watts dunton and i take it as high testimony to the charm of whistler's quaintness that watts dunton did not hate him you may be aware that swinburne in eighty eight wrote for one of the monthly reviews a criticism of the ten o'clock lecture he paid courtly compliments to whistler as a painter but joined issue with his theories straightway there appeared in the world a little letter from whistler deriding one algernon swinburne outsider putney it was not in itself a very pretty or amusing letter and still less so did it seem in the light of the facts which watts dunton told me in some such words as these after he published that lecture of his jimmy whistler had me to dine with him at kettner's or somewhere he said now theodore i want you to do me a favour 
He wanted to get me to get Swinburne to write an article about his lecture. I said, No, Jimmy Whistler, I can't ask Algernon to do that. He's got a great deal of work on hand just now, a great deal of work. And besides, this sort of thing wouldn't be at all in his line. But Jimmy Whistler went on appealing to me. He said it would do him no end of good if Swinburne wrote about him. And, well, I half gave in. I said perhaps I would mention the matter to Algernon. And next day I did. I could see Algernon didn't want to do it at all. But, well, there, he said he'd do it to please me. And he did it. And then Jimmy Whistler published that letter. A very shabby trick, very shabby indeed. Of course, I do not vouch for the exact words in which Watts Dunton told me this tale, but this was exactly the tale he told me. I expressed my astonishment. He added that, of course, he never wanted to see the fellow again after that, and never did. But presently, after a long gaze into the coals, he emitted a chuckle, as for earlier memories of such a funny fellow. One quite recent memory he had, too. When I took on the name of Dunton, I had a note from him. Just this, with his butterfly signature. Theodore. What's Dunton? That was very good. Very good. But, of course, he added gravely, I took no notice. And, no doubt, quite apart from the difficulty of finding an answer in the same vein, he did very well in not replying. Loyalty to Swinburne forbade. But I see a certain pathos in the unanswered message. It was a message from the hand of an old jester, but also, I think, from the heart of an old man. A signal waved jauntily, but in truth wistfully, across the gulf of years and estrangement, and one could wish it had not been ignored. Some time after Whistler died, I wrote for one of the magazines an appreciation of his curious skill in the art of writing. Watts Dunton told me he had heard of this from Swinburne. I, myself, he said, very seldom read the magazines, but Algernon always has a look at them. There was something to me very droll and cheery, too, in this picture of the illustrious recluse snatching at the current issues of our twaddle, and I was immensely pleased at hearing that my article had interested him very much. I inwardly promised myself that as soon as I reached home I would read the article to see just how it might have struck Swinburne. When in due course I did this, I regretted the tone of the opening sentences, in which I declared myself no book-lover, and avowed a preference for an uninterrupted view of my fellow-creatures. I felt that had I known my article would meet the eye of Swinburne, I should have cut out that overture. I dimly remembered a fine passage in one of his books of criticism, something, I preferred not to verify it, about the dotage of Dunstam, which cannot perceive, or the impudence of insignificance so presumptuous as to doubt that the elements of life and literature are indivisibly mingled one into another, and that he to whom books are less real than life will assuredly find in men and women as little reality as in his accursed crassness he deserves to discover. I quailed. I quailed. But mine is a resilient nature, and I promptly reminded myself that Swinburne's was a very impersonal one. He would not think the less highly of me, for he had never thought about me in any way whatsoever. All was well. I knew I could revisit the Pines, when next Watts Dunton should invite me, without misgiving. And to this day I am rather proud of having been mentioned, though not by name, and not consciously, and unfavorably, by Swinburne. 
I wonder that I cannot recall more than I do recall of those hours at the Pines. It is odd how little remains to a man of his own past, how few minutes of even his memorable hours are not clean forgotten, and how few seconds in any one of those minutes can be recaptured. I am middle-aged, and have lived a vast number of seconds. Subtract one-third from those, for one mustn't count sleep as life. The residual number is still enormous. Not a single one of those seconds was unimportant to me in its passage. Many of them bored me, of course, but even boredom is a positive state. One chafes at it and hates it. Strange that one should afterwards forget it, and stranger still that of one's actual happiness and unhappiness so tiny and tattered a remnant clings about one of those hours at the pines of that past within a past there was not a minute nor a second that i did not spend with pleasure memory is a great artist we are told she selects and rejects and shapes and so on no doubt elderly persons would be utterly intolerable if they remembered everything everything nevertheless is just what they themselves would like to remember and just what they would like to tell to everybody be sure that the ancient mariner though he remembered quite as much as his audience wanted to hear and rather more about the albatross and the ghastly crew was inwardly raging at the sketchiness of his own mind and believe me that his stopping only one of three was the merest oversight i should like to impose on the world many tomes about the pines but scant though my memories are of the moments there very full and warm in me is the whole fused memory of the two dear old men that lived there i wish i had watt stunton's sure faith in meetings beyond the grave i am glad i do not disbelieve that people may so meet i like to think that some day in elysium i shall not without diffidence approach those two and reintroduce myself i can see just how courteously swinburne will bow over my hand not at all remembering who i am watt stunton will remember me after a moment oh to be sure yes i've a great deal of work on hand just now a great deal of work but we shall sit down together on the asphodel and i cannot but think we shall have whisky toddy even there he will not have changed he will still be shaggy and old and chubby and will wear the same frock coat with the same creases in it swinburne on the other hand will be quite quite young with a full mane of flaming auburn locks and no clothes to hinder him from plunging back at any moment into the shining elysian waters from which he will have just emerged i see him skim lightly away into that element on the strand is sitting a man of noble and furrowed brow it is mazzini still thinking of liberty and anon the tiny young english amphibian comes ashore to fling himself dripping at the feet of the patriot and to carol the republican ode he has composed in the course of his swim he's wonderfully active active in mind and body watts dunton says to me i come to the shore now and then just to see how he's getting on but i spend most of my time inland i find i've so much to talk over with gabriel not that he's quite the fellow he was he always had rather a cult for dante you know and now he's more than ever under the florentine influence he lives in a sort of monastery that dante has here and there he sits painting imaginary portraits of beatrice and giving them all to dante but he still has his great moments and there's no one quite like him no one algernon won't even come and see him because that fellow mazzini's as anti-clerical as ever and makes a principle of having nothing to do with dante look there's algernon going into the water again he'll tire himself out he'll catch cold he'll 
and here the old man rises and hurries down to the sea's edge now algernon he roars i don't want to interfere with you but i do think my dear old friend and then with a guffaw he breaks off remembering that his friend is not deaf now nor old and that here in elysium where no ills are good advice is not needed end of section five section six of and even now by max beerbohm this librivox recording is in the public domain section six a letter that was not written nineteen fourteen one morning lately i saw in my newspaper an announcement that enraged me it was made in the direst most casual way as though nobody would care a rap and this did but whet the wrath i had in knowing that adam street adelphi was to be undone the tivoli music hall about to be demolished and built anew was to have a frontage of thirty feet if you please in adam street why because the london county council with its fixed idea that the happiness of mankind depends on the widening of the strand had decreed that the tivoli's new frontage thereon should be thirty feet further back and had granted as consolation to the tivoli the right to spread itself around the corner and wreck the work of the brothers adam could not this outrage be averted there sprang from my lips that fiery formula which has sprung from the lips of so many choleric old gentlemen in the course of the past hundred years and more i shall write to the times if adam street were a thing apart i should have been stricken enough heaven knows at thought of its beauty going its dear tradition being lost but not as an unrelated masterpiece was adam street built by the brothers whose name it bears an integral part it is in their noble design of the adelphi it is the very key to the adelphi the well-ordained initiation for us into that small matchless quarter of london where peace and dignity do still reign peace the more beatific and dignity the finer by instant contrast with the chaos of hideous sounds and sights hard by what man so gross that passing out of the strand into adam street down the mild slope to the river he has not cursed the age he was born into or blessed it because the adelphi cannot in earlier days have had for any one this fullness of peculiar magic Adam Street is not so beautiful as the serene terrace it goes down to, nor so curiously grand as crook-backed John Street. But the brothers did not mean it to be so. They meant it just as an harmonious lead to those inner glories of their scheme. Ruin that approach, and how much else do you ruin of a thing which, done perfectly by masters, and done by them here as nowhere else could they have done it, ought to be guarded by us very jealously how to raise on this irregular and barbarous ground a quarter that should be polite congruous in tone with the smooth river behind it this was the irresistible problem the brothers set themselves and slowly coolly perfectly solved so long as the adelphi remains to us a microcosm of the eighteenth century is ours if there is any meaning in the word sacrilege that i remember was the beginning of one of the sentences i composed while i paced my room thinking out my letter to the times i rejected that sentence i rejected scores of others they were all too vehement though my facility for indignation is not i hope less than that of my fellows 
I never had written to the Times, and now, though I flattered myself I knew how the thing ought to be done, I was unsure that I could do it. Was I beginning too late? Restraint was the prime effect to be aimed at. If you are intemperate, you don't convince. I wanted to convince the readers of the Times that the violation of the Adelphi was a thing to be prevented at all costs. Soberness of statement, a simple, direct, civic style, with only an underthrob of personal emotion, were what I must at all costs achieve. Not too much of mere aesthetics, either, nor of mere sentiment for the past. No more than a brief eulogy of those admirably proportioned streets so familiar to all students of eighteenth-century architecture and perhaps a passing reference to the shades of Dr. Johnson, Garrick, Hannah Moore, Sir Joshua Reynolds, Topham Beauclerk, and how many others. The sooner my protests were put in terms of commerce, the better for my cause. The more clearly I were to point out that such antiquities as the Adelphi are as a magnet to the moneyed tourists of America and Europe, the likelier would my readers be to shudder at a proposal which, if carried into effect, will bring discredit on all concerned, and will in some measure justify Napoleon's hitherto unjustified taunt that we are a nation of shopkeepers. I am, sir, your obedient servant. Good. I sat down to a table and wrote out that conclusion, and then I worked backwards, keeping well in view the idea of restraint. But that quality which is little sister to restraint, and is yet far more repulsive to the public mind than vehemence, emerged to misguide my pen. Irony, in fact, played the deuce. I found myself writing that a nation which, in its ardour for beauty and its reverence for great historic associations, has lately dispersed, after only a few months' hesitation, two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to save the Crystal Palace, where the bank holidays of millions of toilers have been spoilt by the utter gloom and nullity of the place, a nullity and gloom that will, however, and of course be dispelled so soon as the place is devoted to permanent exhibitions of New Zealand pippins, Rhodesian tobacco, Australian mutton, Canadian snowshoes, and other glories of empire, might surely not be asked in vain to... But I deleted that sentence, and tried another, in another vein. My desire to be straightforward did but topple me into excess of statement. My sorrow for the Adelphi came out as sentimentality, my anger against the authorities as vulgar abuse. Only the urgency of my cause upheld me. I would get my letter done, somehow, and post it. But there flitted through my mind that horrid doubt which has flitted through the minds of so many choleric old gentlemen in the course of the past hundred years and more. Will the Times put my letter in? If the Times wouldn't, what then? At least my conscience would be clear. I should have done what I could to save my beloved quarter. But the process of doing it was hard and tedious and I was glad of the little respite presented by the thought that I must, before stating my case thoroughly, revisit Adam Street itself, to gauge precisely the extent of the mischief threatened there. On my way to the Strand I met an old friend, one of my links with whom is his love of the Adams's work. He had not read the news, and I am sorry to say that I, in my selfish agitation, did not break it to him gently. Rallying, he accompanied me on my sombre quest. I had forgotten there was a hosier's shop next to the Tivoli, at the corner of the right-hand side of Adam Street. We turned past it, and were both of us rather surprised that there were other shops down that side. 
They ought never to have been allowed there, but there they were. And, of course, I felt it was the old facades above them that really counted. We gazed, meanwhile, at the facades on the left-hand side, feasting our eyes on the proportions of the pilasters, the windows, the old seemly elegance of it all, the greatness of the manor with the sweet smallness of the scale it wrought on. Well, I said, turning abruptly away, to business. Thirty feet, how much about is that? My friend moved to the exact corner of the strand, and then steadily, methodically, with his eyes to the pavement, walked thirty toe-to-heel paces down Adam Street. This, he said, is where the corner of the Tivoli would come. Not will come, observe. I thanked him for that. He passed on, measuring out the thirty additional feet. There was, in his demeanour, something so finely official that I felt I should at least have the government on my side. Thus it was with no sense of taking a farewell look, but rather to survey a thing half saved already, that I crossed over to the other side of the road, and then, lifting my eyes and looking to and fro, beheld what? I blankly indicated the thing to my friend. How long had it been there, that horrible, long, high frontage of grey stone? It must surely have been there before either of us was born. It seemed to be a very perfect specimen of 1860 to 1870 architecture, perfect in its pretentious and hateful smugness. And neither of us had ever known it was there. Neither of us, therefore, could afford to laugh at the other, nor did either of us laugh at himself. We just went blankly away and parted. I dare say my friend found presently, as I did, balm in the knowledge that the Tivoli's frontage wouldn't, because it couldn't, be so bad as that which we had just for the first time seen. For me there was another, a yet stronger, balm, and I went as though I trod on air, my heart singing within me. For I had not, after all, to resume my task of writing that letter to the Times. End of section 6section seven of and even now this librivox recording is in the public domain section seven books within books nineteen fourteen they must i suppose be classed among biblia a biblia greek ignored in the catalogue of any library not one of them lurking in any uttermost cavern under the reading-room of the British Museum, none of them ever printed even for private circulation, these books, written by this and that character in fiction, are books only by courtesy and good will. But how few, after all, the books that are books! Charles Lamb let his kind heart master him, when he made that too brief list of books that aren't. Book is an honourable title, not to be conferred lightly. A volume is not necessarily, as Lamb would have had us think, a book because it can be read without difficulty. The test is whether it was worth reading, had the author something to set forth and had he the specific gift for setting it forth in written words, and did he use this rather rare gift conscientiously and to the full, and were his words well and appropriately printed and bound? If you can say yes to these questions, then only, I submit, is the title of book deserved. If Lamb were alive now, he certainly would draw the line closer than he did. Published volumes were few in his day, though not, of course, few enough. 
even he, in all the plenitude of his indulgence, would now have to demur that at least ninety per cent of the volumes that the publishers thrust on us so hectically every spring and autumn are a biblia, Greek. What would he have to say of the novels, for example? These commodities are all very well in their way, no doubt, but let us have no illusions as to what their way is. The poulterer who sells strings of sausages does not pretend that every individual sausage is in itself remarkable. He does not assure us that this is a sausage that gives furiously to think, or this is a singularly beautiful and human sausage, or this is undoubtedly the sausage of the year. Why are such distinctions drawn by the publisher? when he publishes as he sometimes does a novel that is a book or at any rate would be a book if it were decently printed and bound then by all means let him proclaim its difference even at the risk of scaring away the majority of readers i admit that i myself might be found in that majority i am shy of masterpieces nor is this merely because of the many times i have been disappointed at not finding anything at all like what the publishers expected me to find as a matter of fact those disappointments are dim in my memory it is long since i ceased to take publishers opinions as my guide i trust now for what i ought to read to the advice of a few highly literary friends but so soon as i am told that i must read this or that and have replied that i instantly will i become strangely loath to do anything of the sort and what i like about books within books is that they never can prick my conscience it is extraordinarily comfortable that they don't exist and yet for even as must implants distaste so does can't stir sweet longings how eagerly would i devour these books within books what fun what a queer emotion to fish out from a fourpenny box in a windy by-street walter lorraine by arthur pendennis or passion flowers by rosa bunyan i suppose poor rosa's muse so fair and so fervid in rosa's day would seem a trifle fatigued now but what allowances one would make lord steyne said of walter lorraine that it was very clever and wicked i fancy we should apply neither epithet now indeed i have always suspected that penn's maiden effort may have been on a plane with the great hogarty diamond yet i vow would i not skip a line of it who put back the clock is another work which i especially covet poor gideon forsyth he was abominably treated as stevenson relates in the matter of that grand but grisly piano and i have always hoped that perhaps in the end as a sort of recompense fate ordained that the novel he had anonymously written should be rescued from oblivion and found by discerning critics to be not at all bad Quote, he had never acknowledged it or only to some intimate friends while it was still in proof after its appearance and alarming failure the modesty of the author had become more pressing and the secret was now likely to be better kept than that of the author of waverley End quote. such an humiliation as gideon's is the more poignant to me because it is so rare in english fiction in nine cases out of ten a book within a book is an immediate an immense success on the whole our novelists have always tended to optimism especially they who have written mainly to please their public it pleases the public to read about any sort of success the greater the more sudden and violent the success the more valuable it is as ingredient in a novel 
and since the average novelist lives always in a dream that one of his works will somehow catch on as no other work ever has caught on yet it is very natural that he should fondly try meanwhile to get this dream realized for him vicariously by this or that creature of his fancy true he is usually too self-conscious to let his creature achieve his sudden fame and endless fortune through a novel usually it is a play that does the trick in the victorian time it was almost always a book of poems oh for the spacious days of tennyson and swinburne in how many a three-volume novel is mentioned some slim octavo which seems from the account given to have been as arresting as poems and ballads without being less acceptable than idols of the king these verses were always the anonymous work of some very young very poor man who supposed they had fallen stillborn from the press until one day a week or so after publication as he walked moodily and in a brown study along the strand having given up all hope now that he would ever be in a position to ask hilda to be his wife a friend accosted him seen the thunderer this morning by george there's a column review of a new book of poems etc in some three-volume novel that i once read at a seaside place having borrowed it from the little circulating library there was a young poet whose sudden leap into the front rank has always laid a special hold on my imagination the name of the novel itself i cannot recall but i remember the name of the young poet aylmer dean and the forever unforgettable title of his book of verse was poments being poems of the mood and the moment what would i not give to possess a copy of that work though he had suffered and though suffering is a sovereign preparation for great work i did not at the outset foresee that aylmer dean was destined to wear the laurel in real life i have rather a flair for future eminence in novels i am apt to be wise only after the event there the young men who do in due course take the town by storm have seldom shown to my dull eyes promise their spoken thoughts have seemed to me no more profound or pungent than my own all that is best in these authors goes into their work but though i complain of them on this count i admit that the thrill for me of their triumphs is the more rapturous because every time it catches me unawares one of the greatest emotions i ever had was from the triumph of the gift of gifts of this novel within a novel the author was not a young man at all but an elderly clergyman whose life had been spent in a little rural parish he was a dear simple old man a widower he had a large family a small stipend judge then of his horror when he found that his eldest son a scholar at christminster college oxbridge had run into debt for many hundreds of pounds where to turn the father was too proud to borrow of the neighbourly nobleman who in oxbridge days had been his chum nor had the father ever practised the art of writing we are told that his sermons were always extempore but years ago he had once thought of writing a novel based on an experience which happened to a friend of his this novel in the fullness of time he now proceeded to write though without much hope of success he knew that he was suffering from heart disease but he worked feverishly night after night we are told in his old faded dressing-gown till the dawn mingled with the light of his candle and warned him to snatch a few hours rest failing which he would be little able to perform the round of parish duties that awaited him in the daytime no wonder he had not much hope no wonder i had no spark of hope for him 
But what are obstacles for but to be overleapt? What avails heart disease? What availed the feverish haste and total lack of literary training as against the romantic instinct of the lady who created the Reverend Charles Hailing? The gift of gifts was acclaimed as a masterpiece by all the first-class critics. Also, it very soon brought in ten times as much money as was needed to pay off the debts of its author's eldest son. Nor, though Charles Hailing died some months later, are we told that he died from the strain of composition. We are left merely to rejoice at knowing he knew, at the last, that his whole family was provided for. I wonder why it is that, whilst these Charles Hailings and Aylmer Deans delightfully abound in the lower reaches of English fiction, we have so seldom found in the work of our great novelists anything at all about the writing of a great book. It is true, of course, that our great novelists have never had, for the idea of literature itself, that passion which has always burned in the great French ones. Their own art has never seemed to them the most important and interesting thing in life. Also, it is true that they have had other occupations, fox-hunting, preaching, editing magazines, what not. Yet to them literature must, as their own main task, have had a peculiar interest and importance. No fine work can be done without concentration and self-sacrifice, and toil and doubt. It is nonsense to imagine that our great novelists have just forged ahead or ambled along, reaching their goal in the good old English fashion by sheer divination of the way to it. A fine book, with all that goes to the making of it, is as fine a theme as a novelist can have. But it is a part of English hypocrisy, or let it be more politely said, English reserve, that whilst we are fluent enough in grumbling about small inconveniences, we insist on making light of any great difficulties or griefs that may beset us. And just there, I suppose, is the reason why our great novelists have shunned great books as subject matter. It is fortunate for us, jarring though it is to our patriotic sense, that Mr. Henry James was not born an Englishman, that he was born of a race of specialists, men who are impenitent specialists in whatever they take up, be it sport, commerce, politics, anything. And it is fortunate for us that in Paris, and in the straightest literary sect there, his method began to form itself, and the art of prose fiction became to him a religion. In that art he finds as much inspiration as Swinburne found in the art of poetry. Just as Swinburne was the most learned of our poets, so is Mr. James the most learned of our, let us say our, prose writers. I doubt whether the heaped total of his admirations would be found to outweigh the least one of the admirations that Swinburne had, but though he has been a level-headed reader of the works that are good enough for him to praise his abstract passion for the art of fiction itself has always been fierce and constant partly to the parisian partly to the american element in him we owe the stories that he and of our great writers he only has written about books and the writers of books here, indeed, in these incomparable stories, are imaginary great books that are as real to us as real ones are. Sometimes, as in the author of Beltraffio, a great book itself is the very hero of the story. We are not told what exactly was the title of that second book, which Ambient's wife so hated that she let her child die, rather than that he should grow up under the influence of its author, but I have a queer conviction that it was the daisies. Usually, in these stories, 
it is through the medium of some ardent young disciple, speaking in the first person, that we become familiar with the great writer. It is thus that we know Hugh Vereker, throughout whose twenty volumes was woven that message, or meaning, that figure in the carpet, which eluded even the elect. It is thus that we know Neil Paraday, the manuscript of whose last book was mislaid and lost so tragically, so comically. And it is also, through Paraday's disciple, that we make incidental acquaintance with Guy Walsingham, the young lady who wrote Obsessions, and with Dora Forbes, the burly man with a red moustache, who wrote The Other Way Round. These two books are the only inferior books mentioned by Mr. James. But stay, I was forgetting The Top of the Tree by Amy Evans, and also those nearly forty volumes by Henry St. George. For all the greatness of his success in life, Henry St. George is the saddest of the authors portrayed by Mr. James. His shadow mirror was splendid, and its splendor is the measure of his shame, the shame he bore so bravely in the ruck of his output. He is the only one of those authors who did not do his best. Of him alone it may not be said that he was generous and delicate and pursued the prize. He is a more pathetic figure than even Dencombe, the author of The Middle Years. Dencombe's grievance was against fate, not against himself. Quote, it had taken too much of his life to produce too little of his art. The art had come, but it had come after everything else. Ah, for another go! Ah, for a better chance! A second chance! That's the delusion! There never was to be but one! We work in the dark, we do what we can, we give what we have. Our doubt is our passion, and our passion is our task. The rest is the madness of art. End quote. The scene of Dencombe's death is one of the most deeply beautiful things ever done by Mr. James. It is so beautiful as to be hardly sad. It rises and glows and gladdens. It is more exquisite than anything in the middle years. No, I will not say that. Mr. James's art can always carry to us the conviction that his character's books are as fine as his own. I crave, it may be a foolish whim, but I do crave ocular evidence for my belief that those books were written and were published. I want to see them all ranged along goodly shelves. A few days ago I sat in one of those libraries which seemed to be doorless. Nowhere to the eye was broken the array of serried volumes. Each door was flush with the surrounding shelves. Across each the edges of the shelves were mimicked, and in the spaces between these edges the backs of books were pasted congruously with the whole effect. Some of these backs had been taken from actual books, Others had been made specially, and were stamped with facetious titles that rather depressed me. Here, thought I, are shelves on which Dencombe's works ought to be made manifest, and Neil Paraday's too, and Vereker's. Not Henry St. George's, of course. He would not himself have wished it, poor fellow. I would have nothing of his, except Shadowmere. But Ray Limbert, I would have all of his, including a first edition of The Major Key. Quote, that fiery-hearted rose as to which we watched, in private, the formation of petal after petal and flame after flame. End quote. And also The Hidden Heart. Quote, the shortest of his novels, but perhaps the loveliest, end quote, as Mr. James and I have always thought. How my fingers would hover along those shelves, always just going to alight, 
but never, lest the spell were broken, alighting. How well they would look there, those treasures of mine! And, most of them having been issued in the seemly old three-volume form, how many shelves they would fill! But I should find a place, certainly, for a certain small brown book, adorned with a gilt griffin between wheat sheaves, the Pilgrim's Scrip, that delightful, though anonymous, work of my old friend Austin Absworthy Beern Feverell. And I should like to find a place for Poems by Aurora Lee. Mr. Snodgrass's book of verses might grace one of the lower shelves. What is the title of it? Amelia's Bower, I hazard. Recollections of the late Lord Byron and Others by Captain Sumpf would be somewhere. For Sumpf did, you will be glad to hear, take Shandon's advice and compile a volume. Bungay published it. Indeed, of the books for which I should find room, there are a good few that bear the imprimatur of Bungay, Desperatin, or The Fugitive Duchess, by the Honourable Percy Popjoy, was Bungay's, and so, of course, were Passion Flowers and Walter Lorraine. Of the books issued by the rival firm of Bacon, I possess but one, Memoirs of the Poisoners, by Dr. Slocum. Near to Popjoy's romance would be The Lady Flabella, of which Mrs. Wittitterly said to Kate Nickleby, So voluptuous, is it not? So soft. Who put back the clock would have a place of honour, unearned by its own merits? Among the novels that I could not spare, the gift of gifts would conspicuously glean. As for poments, ah, I should not be content with one copy of that. Even at the risk of crowding out a host of treasures, I vow I would have a copy of every one of the editions that poments ran through. End of section 7《Section Eight of And Even Now》by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section Eight: The Golden Drugget, 1918. Primitive and essential things have great power to touch the heart of the beholder. I mean such things as a man ploughing a field, or sowing or reaping, a girl filling a pitcher from a spring, a young mother with her child a fisherman bending his nets, a light from a lonely hut on a dark night. Things such as these are the best themes for poets and painters, and appeal to aught that there may be of painter or poet in any one of us. Strictly they are not so old as the hills, but they are more significant and eloquent than hills. Hills will outlast them, but hills glacially surviving the life of man on this planet are of as little account as hills tremulous and hot in ages before the life of man had its beginning. Nature is interesting only because of us, and the best symbols of us are such sights as I have just mentioned, sights unalterable by fashion of time or place, sights that in all countries always were and never will not be. It is true that in many districts nowadays there are elaborate new kinds of machinery for ploughing the fields and reaping the corn. In the most progressive districts of all, I dare say, the very sowing of the grain is done by means of some engine with better results than could be got by hand. For aught I know, there is a patented invention for catching fish by electricity, it is natural that we should in some degree pride ourselves on such triumphs. It is well that we should have poems about them and pictures of them. But such poems and pictures cannot touch our hearts very deeply. They cannot stir in us the sense of our kinship with the whole dim past and the whole dim future. 
the ancient Egyptians were great at scientific dodges, very great indeed, nearly as great as we, the archaeologists tell us. Sand buried the memory of those dodges for a rather long time. How are we to know that the glories of our present civilization will never be lost? The world's coal mines and oil fields are exhaustible, and it is not, I am told, by any means certain that scientists will discover any good substitutes for the materials which are necessary to mankind's present pitch of glory. Mankind may, I infer, have to sink back into slow and simple ways, continent be once more separated from continent, nation from nation, village from village. And even supposing that the present rate of traction and communication and all the rest of it can forever be maintained, is our modern way of life so great a success that mankind will surely never be willing to let it lapse? Doubtless that present rate can be not only maintained, but also accelerated immensely in the near future. Will these great glories be voted, even by the biggest fools, an improvement? We smile already at the people of the early 19th century who thought that the vistas opened by applied science were very heavenly. We have travelled far along these vistas. Light is not abundant in them, is it? We are proud of having gone such a long way. But, peradventure, those who come after us will turn back sooner or later of their own accord. This is a humbling thought. If the wonders of our civilization are doomed, we should prefer them to cease through lack of the minerals and mineral products that keep them going. Possibly they are not doomed at all, but this chance counts for little as against the certainty that, whatever happens, the primitive and essential things will never, anywhere, wholly cease while mankind lasts. And thus it is that Brown's Ode to the Steam Plow, Jones's sonnet sequence on the automatic reaping machine, and Robinson's epic of the piscis idle dynamo leave unstirred the deeper depths of emotion in us. The subjects chosen by these three great poets do not much impress us when we regard them sub specie eternitatis. Smith has painted nothing more masterly than his picture of a girl turning a hot water tap. But has he never seen a girl fill a pitcher from a spring? Smithers' picture of a young mother seconding a resolution at a meeting of a board of guardians is magnificent as brushwork. But why not have cut out the board and put in the baby? I yield to no one in admiration of Smithkin's façade of the Waldorf Hotel by night in peacetime, but a single light from a lonely hut would have been a finer theme. I should like to show Smithkin's the thing that I call the golden drugget, or rather, as this thing is greatly romantic to me, and that painter is so unfortunate in his surname, I should like Smithkin's to find it for himself. These words are written in wartime and in England. There are, I hear, lightning restrictions even on the far Riviera di Levante. I take it that the golden drugget is not outspread now a night across the high dark coast road between Rapallo and Zoagli. But the lonely wayside inn is still there, doubtless, and its narrow door will again stand open giving out for wayfarers its old span of brightness into darkness when peace comes. It is nothing by daylight, that inn. If anything, it is rather an offence. Steep behind it rise mountains that are grey all over with olive trees, and beneath it, on the other side of the road, the cliff falls sheer to the sea. The road is white, the sea and sky are usually of a deep, bright blue. There are many single cypresses among the olives. It is a scene of good color and noble form. It is a gay and a grand scene, in which the inn, though unassuming, is unpleasing, if you pay attention to it. An ugly little box-like inn. A stuffy-looking and uninviting inn 
salt and tobacco it announces in faint letters above the door may be bought there but one would prefer to buy these things elsewhere there is a bench outside and a rickety table with a zinc top to it and sometimes a peasant or two drinking a glass or two of wine the proprietress is very unkempt to don quixote she would have seemed a princess and the inn a castle and the peasants notable magicians don quixote would have paused here and done something not so do i by daylight on the way down from my little home to rapallo or up from rapallo home i am indeed hardly conscious that this inn exists by moonlight too it is negligible stars are rather unbecoming to it but on a thoroughly dark night when it is manifest as nothing but a strip of yellow light cast across the road from an ever open door great always is its magic for me is i mean was but then i mean also will be and so i cleave to the present tense the nostalgic present as grammarians might call it likewise when i say that thoroughly dark nights are rare here i mean that they are rare in the gulf of genoa clouds do not seem to like our landscape but it has often struck me that italian nights whenever clouds do congregate are somehow as much darker than english nights as italian days are brighter than days in england they have a heavier and thicker nigritude they shut things out from you more impenetrably they enclose you as in a small pavilion of black velvet this tenement is not very comfortable in a strong gale it makes you feel rather helpless and gales can be strong enough in the late autumn in the riviera di levante it is on nights when the wind blows its hardest but makes no rift anywhere for a star to peep through, that the golden drugget, as I approach it, gladdens my heart the most. The distance between Rapallo and my home up yonder is rather more than two miles. The road curves and zigzags sharply, for the most part, but at the end of the first mile it runs straight for three or four hundred yards, and as the inn stands at a point midway on this straight course, the golden drugget is visible to me long before I come to it. Even by starlight it is good to see. How much better, if I happen to be out on a black, rough night, when nothing is disclosed but this one calm, bright thing. Nothing? Well, there has been, describable all the way, a certain grey glimmer immediately in front of my feet, this in point of fact is the road and by following it carefully i have managed to escape collision with trees bushes stone walls the continuous shrill wailing of trees branches writhing unseen but near and the great hoarse roar of the sea against the rocks far down below are no cheerful accompaniment for the buffeted pilgrim he feels that he is engaged in single combat with nature at her unfriendliest he isn't sure that she hasn't supernatural allies working with her witches on broomsticks circling closely round him demons in pursuit of him or waiting to leap out on him and how about mere robbers and cutthroats suppose but look that streak yonder look the golden drugget there it is familiar serene festal that the pilgrim knew he would see it in due time does not diminish for him the queer joy of seeing it nay this emotion would be far less without that foreknowledge some things are best at first sight others and here is one of them do ever improve by recognition i remember that when i first beheld this steady strip of light shed forth over a threshold level with the road it seemed to me conceivably sinister it brought Stevenson to my mind, the chink of doubloons and the clash of cutlasses, and I think I quickened pace as I passed it. But now, now it inspires in me a sense of deep trust and gratitude, and such awe as I have for it is altogether a loving awe. 
as for holy ground that should be trod lightly. A drugget of crimson cloth across a London pavement is rather resented by the casual passer-by as saying to him, Step across me, stranger, but not along me, not in. And for answer, he spurns it with his heel. Stranger, come in, is the clear message of the golden drugget. This is but a humble and earthly hostel, yet you will find here a radiant company of angels and archangels. And always I cherish the belief that if I obeyed the summons, I should receive fulfillment of the promise. Well, the beliefs that one most cherishes, one is least willing to test. I do not go in at that open door, but lingering, but reluctant, is my tread as I pass by it. And I pause to bathe in the light that is, as the span of our human life, granted between one great darkness and another. End of section 8